So I'm really um, honored to be here. Nya Zhong, what Zhao, Zhong Shanji Mei Shotla. In Hmong, that means greetings, and it is my pleasure to meet all of you. Before I begin, I want to express a deep uh, gratitude to the EAC as well as the Democracy Fund for convening this very, very critical conversation, not just for this election cycle, but I believe for the remainder of how we want to do civic engagement in this country as we look at our growing population and the language needs within our communities. I also cannot uh, move on uh, without recognizing Professor, uh, Professor Bill Beeman. Bill, where are you? Uh, he's in the back. Uh, he has been wonderfully patient and thoughtful in helping those of us who are doing these um, summit talks uh, as we're pulling our conversations together. So Bill, thank you so much for your patience. Um, as I said, it is truly a privilege to be standing before you today and to share with you my stories and memories uh, that are deeply embedded in my family's past. These memories and experiences are a touchstone for me. Um, they're an ongoing reminder of the ideals that motivate me in my work. Uh, many of the other speakers today and the panelists today have or will be discussing with you what we do and how we do it when it comes to language access. But what I want to focus on is something else, uh, something even more essential. I want to focus on the why. I was born in a thatch roof bamboo hut in a small jungle village in northern Laos where there was no electricity or running water. And while much of my memory of my family's journey to the United States has been recreated from years of retelling by my parents, the moments of real recollection are not only dark and painful, but also significant in shaping how we've chosen to live our lives in this country. And while I don't recall much of the details, I do remember walking for days and days by foot, arriving in the middle of the night at a river bank that has now come to symbolize the border between two equally difficult choices, stay and live with the fear of death and persecution, or cross the river to a shaky future fraught with danger and fear of the unknown. I have flashbacks to those long, hot nights as we struggled to fall asleep inside the airless, makeshift army tents, fighting for space among the restless mass of bodies, twisting and turning under the cover of mosquito nets. I'm sure some of them were trying to find relief from the sticky humidity of the night, but others were seeking refuge, however briefly, from the nightmares that haunt them even in their sleep. I remember that my mom was pregnant at the time and then gave birth to my sister in the temporary refugee compound that was provided by the Thai military with the assistance and supervision of the United Nations. I still see the image of my mother wrapping my baby sister in a single surgical scrub shirt that my father had brought back from the refugee health center where he worked as a nursing assistant. As you can see from this photo, that is my mom holding my baby sister and that is my dad in his nursing shirt. Notice the red cross. And of course, that's me, the girl standing there with my brother. Before our escape, my father was a USAID trained medic during the secret war in Laos, the covert CIA operation that was established to stop the flow of weapons and soldiers from North Vietnam into the South. At the refugee camp, I remember standing in line for every meal and recall that the food didn't taste like anything I had ever seen or eaten before, but I ate it anyways because I didn't know when the next meal was going to come or what it was going to look like. I also remember how good it was to finally eat a bowl of white rice in water while licking a small cube of sugar. I was seven years old at the time. And I remember how tough it was during those early days of our refugee resettlement experiences, especially for those of us who were part of the largest wave of Southeast Asians who came to this country in the late 1970s and 80s. I remember being called a chink and gook and enduring showers of spit and trash as we walked to school. You know, coming to the United States as a political refugee, growing up Hmong American in the Midwest, and now working as a national advocate for social justice and civil rights in our nation's capital. 
Sometimes I feel as if I have literally traveled through a warp of space and time, a mind-boggling journey from the refugee camp to even meeting with the President of the United States. And yet at the same time, I find myself in awe of the destiny that I am so fortunate to manifest. I'm in awe that we thrive despite the overt racism and bigotry that we encountered. And I believe that we thrive because compared to so many of our relatives who perished along our flight to freedom, we survived and were given a chance to live. In the deepest parts of our soul, we always knew that we owe it to all of those who didn't or couldn't make it to take full advantage of every opportunity that came our way in this great country. I always knew these truths because my parents taught us how important it was for us to be full citizens of this nation. These lessons began with a reality check that eventually led to my sister and me being elected to public office. So let me share with you this reality check story. On a bright, sunny summer day, as my mother and I sat by our big bay window to make traditional Hmong embroidery, three young men came riding by on their bicycles. As they drew near a window, one of them threw a handful of eggs at the window. And as they were moving by, the second young man came from the other direction and threw yet another handful of eggs at the window. Now, I'm sure that those eggs were not as happy as this egg. And though I was shocked and afraid, I wanted to see these young men closer. So I went up to the window and was trying to identify them. And as I went, got to the window, the third young man came riding up on our lawn, looked me in the eyes, and spat at the window. As the eggs were streaking down both sides of the window and the, the water spit was streaking down the center of the window, and as they rode away, I became so angry and, en and en enraged, I went to our closet and I took out my three aluminum t-ball bats. I put the bats by the door and asked my parents what they were going to do about the situation because clearly I was ready to take some action. Now while my father told me to just ignore these individuals, my mother said some things that provided a direction for my life and gave me a greater reason to make something of myself. My mother said, these people don't know who we are where we came from, or even what kind of people we are. All they see is the color of our skin and the fact that we are different from them. She said, in life and in the reality of living the rest of our lives in America, no matter how American we become, we will never be able to change the shape of our eyes, the texture of our hair, and the color of our skin. Someone somewhere will never like us because of the way we look. Then she said, this is why you must study hard, you must finish high school, and go to college, and come back and be their boss. <laughs> In your lifetime, she said, many, many people will never like you because of the way you look, but some people will have to respect you because of who you are. Shortly after these experience, this experience, my parents became eligible for their citizenship. Now, I remember overhearing them talk about the application process, the paperwork, and the expenses involved. I remember them worrying about the naturalization test and how afraid they were that they might, that they might fail it. To pay for the fingerprints and the application fees, we worked as farmhands picking pickles and cutting cabbage for an entire summer. It was almost comical that my parents had to pay twice to get their fingerprints done because their fingerprints were invalid the first time they did it. So the next time you eat a dill pickle, take a look at the pickle and you will see the little bumps on the pickle. Well, those little bumps represent the thorns on the pickle that, that protected the young plant. And as we tried to pick them from the vine, they cut and tore the skin from our fingertips. So because of the pickle picking, my parents did not have the perfect fingertip lines when their fingers were rolled in the ink and then pressed into the fingerprint boxes. So the prints were invalid and they had to be redone several weeks later after their fingerprints had healed. 
To help my parents prepare for the naturalization test, I took the 200 possible citizenship questions that they brought back from their citizenship class, and I recorded both the questions and the answers onto a 90-minute cassette tape. Who still remembers 90-minute cassette tapes? <laughs> and it went like this. Who is the first president of the United States? Pause. George Washington. They would play this tape over and over and over, mimicking the questions, pausing the tape, giving the answers, then hitting the play button to see if they got the correct answer. The funny thing is, my dad used to play the tape in the car while we were, would go on road trips, and he would make the whole family repeat the questions and the answers together. So by the time my parents passed their citizenship exam, I felt like I knew more about US government than all of my American classmates ever did. Fast forward three years later, as a high school student, I was the first in my family to be able to read, write, and speak English. And in our town, there were very few resources for the newly arrived Hmong American families. On weekends, our relatives would come over to our house with all of their mail from the week in a plastic grocery bag. And one by one, I would dump their week's mail onto our dining table and sort out the junk mail from the bills and letters that needed to be reviewed. I would place the bills in one pile, review and translate the important mail, and either write a response or complete and return forms that needed a response. During these sessions, there would be lively discussions in my parents' living room, sometimes about the difficulties of finding a job, dealing with a racist landlord, or embarrassing encounters at the doctor's offices, all with the underlying theme of how difficult life was when you don't speak the language, or a struggle to understand the behaviors of people who appear to be so different from them. Many of these discussions inevitably came back to my parents telling our relatives how important, how important it was for them to learn to speak English and to become American citizens. My parents believed that their citizenship gave them the right to compete for jobs. They believed that it gave them the right to demand for fair treatment from landlords and employers and police officers. And they believed that their citizenship gave them the opportunity to provide their children with access to scholarships that they could go to college. So remember that 90-minute cassette tape? It was copied so many times that I think if I had copyrighted it and charged for it, it would have almost paid for my college. Well, here's the kicker. No one has ever paid me for all the translation and interpreting work that I've been doing all these years. It's just one of those things that those of us who are bilingual and biculture do all the time, oftentimes by default. So today, I want to do a shout out to all of those whose job it is to do this important work to bridge the language access divide for all of our communities. Another byproduct of the citizenship experience is that my parents became fascinated with political lawn signs and political news. I think as they learned the names of their president, United States senators, and their congressmen, my parents began to recognize and make meaning of the names and the positions around them. I remember having to answer lots of questions about elections and who won and who lost. And unlike most high school students who couldn't care less about politics, I felt like I had to pay attention to the news because my parents would ask questions and I needed to be able to provide them with the answers. At the time, you know, I didn't think very much of these experiences. But today, as I reflect back, I realize that these moments were not only foundational, but they inculcated a culture of political and civic engagement for our extended family and our community that continues even today. The trauma of war, death, and destruction the homes they abandoned in Asia and the families they had left behind did not dampen their spirit 
and willingness to forge ahead to create and establish a new identity, a new community against overwhelming odds as refugees, immigrants, and new Americans. In fact, at least for the Hmong people from Laos, a proud but independent people often marginalized as the minority among minorities in China and Southeast Asia, we finally found a home in the United States of America where we finally felt that we had an equal say, even if through an interpreter, in who we choose to represent us and our interests. I think these historical experiences and the cultural adaptations in those early years as new Americans gave my parents the strength to be our strength when I decided to run for a seat in the Minnesota State Senate and when my sister decided to run for the St. Paul School Board. To my parents, I think to have not just one, but two of their children sit as elected officials at the same time represented the essence of what it meant to be an American. So meet my campaign team. That's me, the tall girl. Um, and the one that you can't really see that's hidden, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's one that's hidden be, uh, behind the last girl. It's hard to see her, but that was my campaign manager. Always doing the behind the background work, you know? When my sister and I were running for office, it was my father who asked our extended family members to help drop literature and pound lawn signs. My mother would organize the women in our extended family to do phone banks in the Hmong language to get people to go out to vote. Our family's experience gave my sister and me a unique insight into the ways in which we needed to conduct our campaigns in order to provide full access to new Americans who were hungry to participate in the political process. And because we lived in St. Paul, Minnesota, our campaign materials were often translated into Hmong, Somali, and Spanish. We went on community radio and television that serviced the Latino Hmong and, Hmong and Somali American communities and talked about our campaigns, but also educated the communities about the significance of each election cycle and asked them to participate even if they couldn't vote for us. We also paid for language-specific political ads in community newspapers something many mainstream candidates would never consider doing, even though it was one of the least expensive campaign cost. For example, a full-page ad in a Hmong newspaper with a circulation of over 25000 would only cost $600. Finally, on election day, we partner with community organizations to provide a number for people to call if they needed interpreters and transportation. I believe that my special election in 2001 was one of the first election protection programs to run in Minnesota. Because we had galvanized and organized new language-specific first-time voter drives, we had received reports of attempted voter suppression activities all across the district. Meet my mom and dad, obviously at the Lincoln Memorial last December. So today, I reflect back on my family's journey from the mountains of war-torn Laos to a refugee camp in Thailand, to the halls of the Minnesota State Senate, and now to the steps of our nation's capital. And I realize that it is an improbable story that can happen only in America. Only in America can a refugee family from the mountains of Laos get their children elected to public offices without witnessing the loss of a single life or the spilling of a single drop of blood. Only in Abraham Lincoln's government of, by, and for the people can anybody, whether refugees, immigrants, Native Americans, or descendants of the pilgrims who works hard and seeks the opportunity can become an elected leader of their communities. In fact, after seeing a news clip of the Obamas voting in their hometown of Chicago, my mom reflected that 
the vote equalizes all citizens in this country because even the president of the United States has to go to the polling booth to vote, well, hopefully, for himself, and that his one vote is no more powerful, no more powerful than the single vote of a new American. On the night that I got elected, I was so struck with emotions that I couldn't deliver my victory speech. And while most people told me to stop crying and to start acting like a leader, my grandmother slowly walked up to me and put her hand on my head, as only the elders are allowed to do, and spoke softly in my ears. She told me to take as much time as I needed to gather myself. And then she said, when you are ready, you go up to that microphone and you speak. And today and every day from this day forward, when you speak, you speak loudly and clearly, especially when you feel that ball of tears gathering in your throat. For those tears represent the hundreds and thousands of souls who have never been heard. Today, your voice is no longer yours. Whenever you get to speak, you are giving voice to those who have never been heard. Well, today, I stand before you representing the voices of great Americans like my parents who love this country who are grateful for the opportunities it provides to their families, and who are hungry, hungry for engagement in the great process of this democratic experiment, who are hungry not only for social, economic, and political relevance, but hungry for power and equity in this great country as equal Americans. So as we all leave this summit, as you all leave the summit and go back to your day jobs, as you engage in decisions to allocate resources or make public policies that affect how our communities access their franchise, heed my grandmother's words. Know that you are the voice for the voiceless and that your work will give voice to those who are longing to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.